Good morning and welcome to Renovation Church. If you've never been here before, I'm Pastor Dustin and uh, you can call me Pastor D. I, you can call me whatever, I guess. Uh, I'll probably, I'll probably listen to you. Um, we're, we're a little bit different, but uh, we're, we like to have fun. We like to enjoy serving and praising God and, uh, and hopefully you do too today. Uh, I don't even know where to begin. It's been, a, it's been an interesting week. I, uh, it's been a busy week. There's been a lot going on, but uh, the Lord's been in all of it. I've heard of salvations from all over the place. I've, I've several other churches. I've talked to their pastors in our area, and they've talked about salvations. I love having those conversations with pastors because that means that, that, that God's just working all over the place, right? And that means if God's working all over the place, that means people are being obedient and letting him work. And so uh, I don't want to miss the boat on that, so I want us to be obedient, and I want us to, I want us to let him work. And uh, I just want to keep moving forward. I'm going to turn my phone off because it's already vibrating. There. I'm that kind of guy, I guess. So, anyway, today, today's sermon, I've been praying about this week. Today's sermon is, if you trust him, they will see him. There's a lot of thought in that, right? If you trust him, people outside of your life, in your life, they will see him. But if you don't trust him, they won't see him at all. What they'll see is your fear and your anxiety and your anxiousness and, and, your, and your overwhelmed life. And, you know, in a world we live in today, and we, like, anxiety is just running rampant, right? Like, like everybody has some form of anxiety going, like, crazy in their life because there's so much. It's so busy, and it's so overwhelming, and, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're designed to take a break. We're designed to breathe a little bit. God designed us to, to slow down every once in a while. And, and the problem is we don't do that enough. And when we do that, we don't give our brain time to slow down and let the Lord work in us. We just go, 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 go. And while we want to be busy for the Lord sometimes, sometimes we can even be so busy for the Lord that we don't give him time to direct us. And that happens. That happens. That's a, that can be a big, big problem. So I want to talk this week, and we're going to be in Philippians, Philippians 4. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Uh, we'll give you one for free. You can have it. Everybody needs to have a copy of the Word. So uh, nobody's going to call you out. Just raise your hand. i got some guys that will get you one, or ladies that will get you one. And, and I want to get into Philippians 4, and I want us to look at what it looks like to really trust Him and walk with Him. Because I want us to be encouraged today. I want us to be encouraged that we are not alone, first of all that there's been a lot of people that have gone before us following the Lord and have, and have had to deal with the anxiety and the stress and all the things that life throws at them, you know, just like we do. And they didn't do it perfectly, but when you serve God, he can take care of the perfect side, you just take care of the obedient side. See, sometimes we're like, we'll be perfect, i got to be perfect before I go to God, and God will be obedient to help me. Listen, it's the other way around. We need to be obedient, he'll do the perfect and so if we're the obedient part and we let him do the perfect part, because we can't do perfect anyway, even if we tried our best, we're going to fail somewhere. But if we follow and we, and we trust and we really give it to him, then, then it'll be okay. We're going to watch a video real quick. I almost forgot. And then we'll come back. Ryan, hey, I saw you on the side of the road with that cop. What happened? Yeah, you got me going 30 over in a school zone. What? Are you crazy? Why would you do that? Well, obviously I was in a hurry. Uh, you must have got a huge ticket. Oh, no, because I had one of these. What is that? Well, this is my God in the box. I opened up the lid and uh, God took care of all my problems. He even had the cop apologize for pulling me over. <laughs> Seriously? I'm surprised that little thing worked. Oh, yeah. Works for me all the time. <laughs> no, that is dumb. Okay, tell him. Yeah, what you need is a super-sized God in a box, maybe! Wow! I know! That's awesome! Yeah! Come on, you guys don't really think you can put God in a box. Well, of course. He's there for whenever you need him. But you need him all the time. Laura, you can't walk around town with God all hanging out and exposed everywhere. I mean, people would see that. Well, isn't that what being a Christian is? I mean, people need to see God. Okay, Laura, think about it like this. Let's say you and God go out to Burger Bonanza one night. You order a burger with no pickles, but they bring it out with pickles. Oh, I hate that. Okay, enough to ruin your night. So, at this point, you're going to want to tuck God back in the box, and then you raise your voice a little bit with the worker. 
And maybe the manager overhears you and he comes and he fires the worker. And when everything's taken care of, you just pull God back out. He doesn't know any different. Have a good night. Nice. No, of course he knows differently. Listen, you can't just put God away when you don't want him there and then pull him back out when you do. It doesn't work like that. God wants a relationship with you all the time. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, what you're talking about is for perfect people like Jesus. And the Pope. Right, and Mother Teresa. I mean, we're normal people. Yeah, I don't even think I could live like that. So you're telling me you can live without God? Yeah. Can you live without God? Um, yeah, it's easy. Can you die without him? Can you die without him? Come on, guys. You can't live without him either. Well, if that doesn't slap you on a Sunday morning, <laughs> then you didn't pay attention. So, so we need to really, we really need to address that because I think a lot of us, we got to be weary of that because uh, we probably live that way even if we don't think we do. Well, I go to church on Sunday. Well, I go to church on Wednesday. Well, what are you doing on the other days? And what are you doing on the, hour, on the other 23 hours you're not in church on Sunday morning? You know, what are you doing with the rest of your life? What are you doing and how's it, how are you walking it out? And if, are you trusting, are you really trusting God to be the leader of your life, to, to walk you where you need to walk, to, to take you where you need to go. And if you are, then that's awesome. Because if you are, then here's the deal. People can see him inside of you. But here's what I'll tell you. If you're like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I am, sure. I want you to just look at your life. When's the last time you shared Jesus with somebody? When's the last time somebody asked you what church you go to? Because they can tell that you're a follower. These are the things that like, if we survey ourselves, we kind of start to ask ourselves, well, am I, if people really know me as a believer or do they just know me as my job or, or the parent of my kids or, you know, whatever. So I want to get into some scripture in, in, in Philippians 4, verse 4. And I think we're going to go through probably verse 14. I'm just going to read. You can follow along. Like I said, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. So I'm going to get you one, but it'll be on the screens also. So in verse 4 of chapter 4, it says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men that the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything be by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your, your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, of good repute, if, 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 there, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and, and seen in me, practice these things and, God, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that na- and I, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that at and now at last you have received your concern for me, revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I will speak from, it, from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I now, or I know how to get along with, get along with humble means. I also know how to live with prosperity in any and every circumstance i have learned the secret of being filled and going and going hungry both of having abundance and suffering need i can do all things through him who strengthens me nevertheless you have done well to share with me in my affliction i want us to kind of dive into this and and really understand what's going on and 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 understand there are some things that god wants us to take from that word and pull it out and understand that that is our direction there's some very specifics. There's, some, there's like five or six uh, things he wants us to go do, and then there's one thing he wants us to not do. And I want to jump into that with, uh, with you because I want you to understand how you can walk out there and be like Christ. Because a lot of times we say, I'm a Christian, which means to be Christ-like, and then we're like, well, what does that mean? Be good? Be nice? No, listen, there's going to be a lot of people that are good and nice that don't know Jesus. we got to be something a little different. And he tells us some things that we've got to be very specific in. So this is our expectation as Christians, and it's hard. It's tough. It's not easy. When you get saved, you're signing up to be part of something that is very, very complicated because 
the world doesn't understand it and they don't like it. So you're signing up to follow a Jesus that died on the cross, rose again so you can have eternity with him, and people will look at you like, why would you want to do that? Because now you've got to follow all these rules and do all these things, and you've got to be perfect. Well, they don't understand. And some people will criticize you and judge you, and they may not do it in front of you. They may do it behind your back. And it may be your family and your friends. It's, it's tough. It's complicated. And it's not easy to follow Jesus. But, man, the reward is so good. And so when we look at this, I want to extract a little bit of stuff. First of all, I want us to focus on the fact that, that where Paul had been to the point at this time. Listen, Paul's been through the ringer. I want you to think about your worst day. Like the worst day of your life. I want you to think about it right now. I want you to think about your worst day you've had, whether you're, you're 10 or you're 80. I want you to think about the worst day that you had. We know what it is because when you think worst day, it pops up, right? It doesn't go away. It was the worst day of your life. I want you to think about what Paul's gone through. He's been imprisoned. He's, he's been under house arrest. He's been, they, they beat him before. They've, he's, been, he's been threatened to be killed. He's, listen, there's not much this guy hasn't been abused in physically. Like they've just whooped this guy up and down all over the place. And yet he still, still stands up and continues to go forward. And you think, man, what did that guy do to get, go through so much stuff? He didn't do anything except for share his love for Jesus. Like he didn't do anything but say, let me tell you about my Savior. On, on, our, on our worst day, we probably don't know near what, what, what he would have had gone through, and even on our worst day. And he had like every day was almost a worst day scenario for him. Who's going who's gonna to attack me today? But you know what I love about him? He didn't stop because he, he wasn't convicted of crimes. He was convicted of loving and sharing Jesus. That's why he got arrested. That's why he got beat up. That's why he got exiled. That's why he got all these things going on. And that's why, you know, it wasn't an easy life for him. It had been way easier for him to be like, well, you know, I've done enough for Jesus. You know, I've, I've said enough. You know, I've did a little bit. I've, I've traveled around. I've been persecuted. He could have said, I'm done. That's getting hard. Some of us do that, right? We, we jump all in in ministry and we're like, well, this is getting complicated now, so I'm just going to step back. It's somebody else's turn. Listen, there's no turns in ministry. There's no tag team. It's not WWF. And if one of you think that I look like Bam Bam Bigelow, you're wrong. <laughs> I, see, I see it in your eyes. Some of you are like, what? Some of you are old enough to know old wrestling. <laughs> I will not get flames on my head. So we think, about, we think about what Paul went through, right? We think about the crazy things that he had to deal with. And he could have just said, I'm done. I'm done. And we look, at, we look at what we have to deal with in our, in our life right now. Think about your life. If you're, we're going to go do what we're supposed to do, Paul was doing what he was supposed to do, and he was being persecuted for it. You know, you probably have an inkling of something that you're supposed to be doing for the Lord, and you won't do it because it's uncomfortable, or it's going to take up time, or I'm going to have to sacrifice this, or I'm going have to have to sacrifice that. But listen, to, look at what Paul was sacrificing, and he never stopped and said, this is not worth it, you all. He didn't write the books in the Bible under God's influence and say, don't do this because this is crazy. I'm doing enough for all of you. Y'all don't do, do any more. He says, no, you, you be like me because I'm being like Christ. We need to be imitators of Jesus. And, and one of the first things I get out of verse 4 is it's rejoice. And he says it twice. Rejoice, rejoice. You know, he says rejoice. What's the first thing we do? Well, we need children's workers or we need parking lot people or we need greeters or we need security or we need... People to help in youth group on Wednesday nights. Oh, I can't do that. How about we rejoice and say, yeah, sign me up? Because that's what Paul would have done. He said, let's just do this. It may not even be what I want to do, but I'm, I'm going to do it because, because God says somebody needs to teach these people about Jesus, and I'm just going to go do it. And even if they beat on me, y'all have been in children's ministry. <laughs> that's a wrestling match sometimes. If you've ever been in children's ministry, it's not easy. And, and, you know, it would be easy to say, well, that's somebody else's, or I've done my time. There's nothing worse than when people say, I've done my time. You, yeah, you, you have no clue. But, but the, instead, Paul says, rejoice, rejoice. When an opportunity comes up to serve, he doesn't say you should get down and be sad. He says, rejoice. Rejoice in the fact that there's an opportunity to serve. 
Oh my goodness, there's a church with kids in it? That's amazing. Let's go, let's go love on them and share Jesus so more kids come. I know so many churches that like don't have children's programs at all because you know why? They don't have children. And they would love for a kid to walk inside the church. And man, they'd probably loved on to the point of like, this is, it was awkward. But, you know, that we, could, we could get to that point, and if we get to that point, then are we really serving God if we're not loving on people? We need to rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in all the stuff we do, in all the ministry we do, no matter what it is. No matter what God has called you to do, you need to be rejoicing in it, in the fact that you have the opportunity to share the greatest thing that's ever happened to you. Amen. The greatest thing that's ever happened to you in your entire life, in your entire eternity, you get the opportunity to share that. That's worth rejoicing. Now, I would be sad if I didn't get the opportunity. If God said, nope, you can't go do it, and I was exiled to be by myself somewhere, I would think about that. I'd be like, this is terrible. I just want to share who Jesus is. I want to tell everybody about him. We talk about when we get saved, we want to go tell everybody. Then we get comfortable. Then we start learning. Then we get, like, like get our name plate on our chair at church, and then I stop doing stuff because I'm now a made person in the church. Like we're the mafia. I don't serve. I'm a made man. No, listen, God says get busy. Is that going to be on the, let's cut that out of the, that doesn't need to be anywhere. So anyway, rejoice and rejoice. Rejoice and rejoice. I'm not made for impersonations, I promise you. But, but listen, rejoice and rejoice. And he says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. You know how, Lord, how close the Lord is? People are always like, I can't wait for his return. This Holy Spirit never left. I mean, I'm excited for the return of Jesus, but he isn't, not, he isn't gone. He's here. So let's, let's act like the Lord is near. Let's act like God is here and God is present because he is. And so what else do we need to do? We need to be gentle. We need to be gentle. We don't, there's no sense in, especially if we're believers, that we should be abrasive and rough with each other. We should love each other and help correct each other out of love, not out of spite and out of anger. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy, and it's, it's just so real, even inside of the church, there's so much discontent for people. Like, I don't, I don't like that person. I won't serve in that ministry because that person's in it. And, and you know, it's, it's, I get that we have human feelings, but my God is bigger than my human feelings. And we have to get past that point. And we can't be rejoicing in ministry and, and be gentle if, if, we're, if we're not trusting God that everybody that comes around me is somebody that he made for a reason, and they're around me for a reason. We don't get to pick the ones we do ministry in. If we're picking the ones we do ministry with, then we're failing. God does the picking. And guess what? If you're a believer and you're saved, he's picked you. Get busy. If we're not busy, then we're not doing what he wants. So we need, to, we need to rejoice and we need to be gentle. What else does he say? He says we need to be known. Be known to all men. Oh, pastor, I can't be known. I'm, a, I'm an introvert. Well, listen, you need to be known. You're going to be known for something. You'll be known as that person that doesn't talk, doesn't share, and doesn't, doesn't talk about anything. They just kind of hide out and, and don't do their own thing. Or you can be that person that says, hey, listen, I'm not comfortable with this, but I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And you can be known for the person that trusts Jesus enough to be uncomfortable and move forward with it. So you're going to be known for something. But what are you going to be known for? What are you known for right now? You know, I mean, just kind of survey your life. You know what you're known for. Think about it. You know what you're known for. I'm, the, I'm unfortunately known for that germaphobe. <laughs> My wife even got me this shirt. I don't know if you can read it. Wash your hands and say your prayers because Jesus and germs are everywhere. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm offended or I'm excited. <laughs> but here's the deal. You're going to be known for something. So if I'm going to be known as that germaphobe freak that talks about Jesus all the time, then so be it. But I want to be known about that one that talks about Jesus all the time. You may know me for other things, but I want that to be in the sentence. And so we need to look at our life. Do people know us? Are we known? Because Scripture says, be known. Now, we all have a past. Maybe we're known for something from the past. That's okay for a moment. You're going to have to let them see you be something else and be known for something else. It doesn't matter what you were. You gotta, when you get saved, they get to see something different, but it's going to take time. 
And when they see it consistent, that eventually all the all the thoughts of well, we'll see. Well, I don't think they're going to be make. They're going to make it. They were too. They were too troublesome. They were too ornery. They were too much this. They were too into this. And over time, they're going to have to say, you know what? I know, I know what they're known for now. They've been consistent in following Jesus. That's what we need to be known for. Oh, sure, you know my past, but you know the day Jesus changed that because you know I'm known for something different now. If you're not known for something that involves Jesus, then what are you doing? We need to really ask ourselves, what, do I, what am I doing and what do I need to do? Because I need people to know me for Jesus. Because if they don't see me trusting God, then they don't see him. And my job as a believer in Jesus Christ, and he's my Lord and Savior, my job is that in that role is to be known as a person who has been saved by his grace so that other people can want what he's given me. And that's our job. So we need to rejoice. We need to be gentle. We need to be known. I'm going to skip down here where it says, it says that we need to pray. It says that. It says we need to pray. But in everything by prayer and supplication. And supplication is simply saying to ask humbly for. It's like saying praying twice. You need, so if we need to rejoice is in there twice. Praying is in there twice. They're in there twice for a reason because those two things are very important. We need to be talking to God twice as much as we do all the other things. And then we need to be rejoicing in the name of Jesus twice as much as we do every other thing. If we're rejoicing in the name of Jesus twice as much as we are in our, in our negative attitudes, I'm telling you, your life will change. Amen. Somehow, your face will find its way into a smile. And I promise you, your cheeks won't break. Just do it in the name of Jesus. If people see you happy, they're going to be like, I want what you have. You're always happy. Maybe you don't have the best job and the best car and the best house, but, man, you're joyful. You're just, you're just always happy, and you don't, you're not about the materials, but you're about the Lord. And what's awesome is when you do that, you want to rejoice, and you want to rejoice even more. And, and, and your life begins to change. So we've got to pray. We've got to pray twice as much as we do anything else. We've got to pray. I don't know who you talk to the most in your life. You know who your best friend is or your spouse. You probably talk to them more than anybody. Do you talk to God as much as you do them? Anywhere close to it? Maybe we need to shift that thought around. Change the way we do it. Next, I want us to look at the being thankful. Be thankful. We've got to be thankful for what we do have and what he has given us. Because regardless of what you may think, it could be worse. It can always be worse. We're one bad decision away from being in a really tough situation, any one of us. But you know, even in that, God loves you and he's there for you. And so it's worth being thankful for the fact that when I'm doing good, he's there. When I struggle, he's there. And when I'm in between those two, he's there. That's worth being thankful for. And if we're thankful for that and we talk to him often and we rejoice in our life, man, I'm telling you, your life will be smiles. And people won't know why. But instead, we go through this life so, so just we're broken. We're broken and we stay that way. We don't have to stay broken. Jesus is that super glue that fills the cracks, and the Holy Spirit is the one that fills the cup. So, I mean, there's no reason to be broken anymore. There's no reason to, to dwell on the things that you've done in the past or to dwell on the things that you're going through right now because even right now in your sins and whatever you're struggling in, Jesus says, just come to me. Just talk to me. Let's get rid of that and let me remove it from you. Let me really remove it from you, not just saying words and, and to, you know, the cupcake words that we see at church that feels so good. I went to the altar and I changed my life, but then I got up and I was the same old person. Well, you didn't follow through. You got to follow through with the prayer and the reading of his word. And so you know exactly what to do with him. We have to know. So, you know, when we look at scripture, a lot of times we're like, I don't have a clue what I'm supposed to do. One thing I've learned being a pastor of this church, and, and I've been in other churches for, for 20 something years, and I've watched people, and for years and years we've used big words and we assumed things. And I've learned here at Renovation Church, it doesn't matter how long you've been following the Lord, we don't know what we, we just don't know. And we need to understand we don't know. 
we got to get rid of the big words and just realize that we need Jesus, and the only way to do it is open up this word and get to our prayer life going and get to rejoicing. And we've got to make it simple, and we've got to understand we have to know what he wants from us if we're going to do what he wants. I don't, if I don't know that I need to rejoice, that I need to be gentle, that I need to be known, that I need to pray, and that I need to be thankful, if I don't know those things, how can I do them? So in, in, my, in my walk with the Lord, he is just, one of those things is just, he's been hammering on me lately is just be simple, Dustin. Stop overcomplicating it. If you just love on people, you tell them the truth, and you share this with them, in the basic form, get rid of the big words, which thank the Lord, because I don't know many of them. I mean, I don't know a lot of y'all know me. I make up words sometimes. I ain't above it. But, you know, if we, just, if we get into what the word actually says, then we do what it actually says, our lives will be changed. But so often we come in and we hear a flowery sermon and we go out there and try to live a flowery life and listen, we're more in the dirt than we are in the plant. So we've got, to, we've got to understand it's in the dirt where the, where the Lord meets us. And if we're going to bloom out of anything, he's going to do it. And, and we've got to get into the word, and we've got, to, we've got to take his word at his word. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. If he says rejoice, then I need to look at my life, and if I'm not rejoicing, I need to figure it out. Because I'm failing at something if I'm not rejoicing in the Lord. If all I'm ever doing is just making it through the day, then I'm not where God wants me to be. Because nowhere in this, this word does God say, I just need you to make it through the day. I just want you to drag through. I want you to pull yourself through to tomorrow. No, he says, I want you to rejoice. When you get a sandwich, rejoice because you got to eat food when maybe you wouldn't have been able to in any other place. When you get to talk to someone and have a, and have a conversation with them, rejoice in the fact that you have friends because there are people out there that would just do anything to have a friend. We don't think about that stuff, but that's the, stu- the simple things. Let's rejoice about them. I've read, in the, I've read three young ladies in the last two months have taken their life, like big known ladies and young girls, not ladies, young girls. I'm going to say girls because they're young. They're 19. Taking their own lives in, 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 in college sports. And it's crazy because they have this expectation of their life from all these people around them. And all these people around them saying, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. And nobody feeding into them on how to live life right, on how to turn to the Lord when you have struggles. And if you're not the best one on the field, it's going to be okay because God's got a better plan for you. But these people are taking their own lives because they don't know how to rejoice in the small things because nobody's showing them. You know, you're rejoicing in front of people. Maybe the only thing that saves someone from taking their own life. That's crazy. I know there's young kids in here, but that's the truth. We live in a world of anxiety. And that anxiety gets so strong sometimes that people are like, I, there's no way for me. There's no way for me to handle this. You know why we feel like that? Because we don't know how to rejoice and we don't know how to be happy. How do I know that? Because substance abuse and all those things are at their highest point ever. Because they're trying to feel something that only Jesus can do. And, and that's where that rejoicing in the Lord comes in and celebrating with buddies and, and sisters and brothers in Christ over the good things. The fact that, man, we got somewhere to sleep tonight. That's awesome. Amen. Let's praise the Lord for that. Because, you know, there are people that don't get to sleep in a bed. So let's praise the Lord for what he gives us. And if we get to eat, let's praise the Lord. And if we get to hang out with somebody, let's praise the Lord. And if we get to come together on a Sunday morning and have a donut in, in air conditioning and in heat, let's rejoice in the Lord. Because that's what makes us happy. When we walk out of the church, we should be smiling and joyful. We should not be walking out thinking, there we go again. Because if you're walking out like that, what did you learn in church today? We've got to learn to rejoice. We've got to be thankful. We've got to be praying. We've got to be gentle. We've got to be gentle. Look at your life, men. Are we gentle? Are you gentle? If you're not gentle, let's start figuring it out. Women, if you're not gentle, let's start figuring it out. Let's take the abrasive edge off. You know what that is? You know why you're not gentle? Because you're afraid. And don't be, listen, that's not a bad thing. Fear is what we all have to deal with. But what we do with it is, can be a very bad thing. 
So when we're, we're abrasive and we feel like we got to be this, this person so people respect me or I get their attention or so I'm known for something, listen, that's not what God wants. God wants you to be gentle, loving, kind. And he wants you to just go out there and love on people. Love on people. That's why in Scripture you see those things. You see, you see where, where, where Jesus would walk up and he would hug and love on people that, he, that, didn't, that didn't love him back. They didn't love Jesus back, but he still loved them. He would wash their feet even though they were getting ready to put him to death. Yeah, we were like, well, that person did me wrong 40 years ago. They owe me $12.50. I ain't giving them time of day. Yeah, Jesus says, oh, you're going to kill me? Let me wash your feet. I think we got our priorities wrong. How about we rejoice in the fact that the Lord has given you another day to forgive them and forgive yourself for being like that. One thing that he says, do not be, he says, do not be anxious. So when I look at this world we live in today and I think about how all the anxiousness that we deal with, we're all dealing with this anxious, this anxiety, this struggles of, of am I good enough? Is this good enough? Is that good enough? Am I going to be enough? Listen, it's not, you're not enough, but Jesus is. Amen. You're not enough, but you need to have Jesus to make you enough. And so when we understand that and we start to look at the things we are supposed to do, that anxiousness will go away, I promise you. Because if you're battling with some anxiety, you're battling with things that, that, that you're living a life that you're not designed to live. There's things in it that you need to get rid of and there's things you need to put in there. Because if you don't have the right recipe, you're going to have a really bad, oh man, I just got to edit myself here. It's just going to be bad. It's just going to be bad. So you got to have the right recipe. If you're, if you're dealing with, 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 with anxiety or anger and, and fear, that, that's not part of the recipe. So you got to get it out of the way. And you got to rejoice and be gentle and be known and pray and be thankful. And when you start to do those things, there's no time. There's no time for things that are going to cause the anxiety. There's no time for it because you're too busy rejoicing in the things the Lord is doing and the things the Lord has done and the things the Lord is going to do. And when you do these things, when you do the, the rejoicing and the being gentle and the being known and the, and the praying and the being thankful, you, the anxiety starts to go away and something happens. Something happens. It says in here that the peace of God, the peace of God will be with you. It doesn't say we'll be with some of you. We'll be with a few of you. It says if you do these things, the peace of God will be with you. If you do these things, the peace of God will be with you. You'll have a guarded heart, and you'll have a guarded mind. That's why we let these things in, because we're not guarding our heart, and we're not guarding our mind. We talked last week about the armor of God. We talked about how it's important to have the, ble- the breastplate on and the helmet on, because we've got to be mindful of what comes in and what goes in, because it makes a hard heart, and a hard heart makes us not nice, makes us abrasive, which makes us not gentle. We've got to be mindful of that. This is our expectation as Christians you know, so often we go in here, and, we, and like I said, we come in here and we, we worship some songs, we do some worship songs worshiping our God, and we, and we do an altar call, which we're going to do an altar call here in a little bit, but we do these things, but we don't walk out of these doors doing these things. All of that is fruitless if we're not doing these things. All of that is repetition and motions if we're not doing these things. Because what, what good is it to praise a God for all the things he's going to do if we never do what he tells us to? Because if, we, if we're praising a God we don't believe and trust in. That's dangerous. That's dangerous for us. If we're going to praise him with three songs in the beginning and we're going to listen to a sermon and we're going to go to the altar to figure these things out and praise him there and we're, going to, and we're going to go back out into this world, we need to take the stuff we read and learn and go forward with it and say, how can I make this applicable in my life? Am I happy? Am I gentle? Am I, am I gentle with my kids? If I'm not, what do I need to change? What do I need to change in that to be more gentle with my kids? Because I don't want, I don't, you know, we're planting the seed, right? If we trust in God and we believe in this, then we're going to do it, and they're going to see him inside of us. But if I'm not being gentle with my kids, this is just the reality, because I struggled with this for a long time in my life. 
with my oldest son more than any because he's older than all the others. He got to see the worst part of Dustin before Dustin started actually serving the Lord. He got to see the abrasive Dustin, the yelling dad, the one that would raise my voice in a heartbeat instead of explaining softly why we don't do this. But you know why I did it? Because I was taught that way. And that was my excuse. Well, I was raised that way. Now, no, the, the, the excuse is because I'm not taking this and making it applicable in my life. I'm not realizing, well, I'm doing what he always did when I need to be doing what he says to do. I don't have to do what the generations before me did. I can break that and say, I'm going to do what my God says do because it, obviously it's able to be done or he wouldn't have given me the task. Obviously it's able to be done by each one of us or he wouldn't have given us the job to do it that way. So when I'm a parent, I'm looking at my kids, I need to understand, I need to be gentle with them and loving with them, even in discipline, so that they know Jesus. You're going to be known for something. What are you going to be known for? What are you going to be known for in your life? What are you going to be known for to your grandkids when you're gone? What are they going to remember grandma and grandpa for? Mom and dad for? Aunt and uncle for? What do your friends know you for? I want you to think about that. And if it's not something that says they know me for my following of Jesus, then I want you to think about your life today. And I want you to really think about, is there something that needs to change? Is there something that has to happen? Because supplication means to ask for humbly. To ask for humbly. And if we're going to ask for something humbly, then we have to understand that we've got to go to God in a position that says, I can't do it myself. I'm, I'm identifying the fact that I'm not the one that can do this. I need you. Which is the best thing, it's the most amazing thing that we have as Christians, as, as believers, as Jesus Christ saved our lives. If we believe in that, if that's what you believe in, he's your Savior, you have that awesome gift of going to him and telling him, I can't do it. And he, he says, I can help you. But we have to be willing to say, I can't do it. Because you're going to be known for something. You're going to, you have to be gentle. You've got to pray. You've got to be thankful. You have to rejoice. There are people in your life that need to know Jesus, and you're the only one that can show them. Are you going to show them? We're going to go into an altar call. And I just, I'm, I'm just going to ask you today, you know, it's, I'm just going to ask you to just think about those things, those simple directions that God tells us to do. And if any of them are, are misfires in your life, maybe some multiple, there's time in my life that I don't know that I hit on any of them. But if there's something today you're misfiring on in that following of Jesus, I made it simple today. I tried to make it as simple as I could because I'm simple. And I need just clear, simple direction. If something's struggling with you today, come down to the altar and talk to God. Come find me. Come find Pastor Hayden. Come find Pastor Tucker. And talk to, talk to us about it. We'll pray with you. But talk, or talk to God. God's the one that can help you, like literally help you and change you. He's the one that can do the shifting and changing in your life. If you're obedient, if you want that anxiety and that stress and, and that to be gone, you want to find relief in your life for the things that you're struggling with, go to the one who can make it go away. We don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. And God wants to help you through it. The altar is yours. Okay, let's give the Lord a hand and some praise this morning. Amen. Oh, good to see everyone out here at Renovation today. Folks, Tide Boxes are on the uh, wall back there. Um, get the Download the app if you're like me and you always forget your checkbook. We have at least two baptisms after the second service. So if you guys want to see some baptisms going on, uh, stick around or come back when you get done. Go grab some coffee and come back. Um, so I wasn't here last week. I've missed everybody. I got to sneak out on a vacation, and I wanted to tell you one quick story before we uh, before we pray and go. Uh, oh, oh, it was cool. Oh, <laughs> was it cool? Um, so I got to sneak out to all these national parks in California. 
Um, and, you know, I, I watch the news, and I'm like, oh, California is full of crazy people. And, you, you know, um, yeah, but there are some beautiful places out there. Those national parks are just wonderful. And there's the voices about how the heavens proclaim the work of God. And, oh, man, Yosemite, when you pull into Yosemite, and there's this view, and these waterfalls are crashing down, and it's just wonderful. And one, But one thing I messed up, and I wanted to share this especially with the guys, is I took a, the wrong ball cap. I took like an old army ball cap, right, and just threw it on and just, you know, went and didn't think about it. And I was sitting there watching this great big waterfall, and I just happened to Google search. There are three million people a year, last year, went into Yosemite. And when you're sitting there, there are people from all over the world. You, know, you can only understand about half the conversations. You know, a lot of Japanese people uh, vacation there, a lot of German speakers, French speakers. They're just from all over the world. And, you know, I'm sitting there, and it just, it, there's nothing wrong with an old army ball cap. I was like, man, if I would have had my renovation hat, you, you know, that, it might it might have been a conversation starter, <laughs> you know. And if you guys, uh, and, uh, but back to you guys specifically, you, it, it's sometimes hard to find the spot to witness to someone. You know, what, do you, what am I going to say to someone who's Japanese, who, you know, who English is a second language or or, it, you know, how do I get this start? You know, there's people running around, and it's just, there's everything going on. But, you know, maybe something little um, God can use. I think God's pretty good at that kind of stuff. And so, as, as we're going forward, just you guys especially, whatever you do, a headgear, what, uh, shirts, um, you know, sometimes we just throw stuff on. You know, we're not big on fashion. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, and and but that's cool. But you know, if if we quit worrying about what the world looks at us like, the fashion idea, and instead think about, man, what what might God want me to do today? Is there someone that I'm supposed to witness to, or some? Maybe there's a seed that I'm supposed to plant. You, you know, maybe we start. Maybe it's just that little bit of difference. Um, you know, and if I would have been out there with a renovation hat and bumped into people from Japan and Germany and France and uh, all over the world, you know, one restaurant I talked to a waitress, she said 50% of her uh, customers in there during the season are from uh, outside the United States. You know how many shirts I saw about Jesus? Zero. Man. You know, and it, but if we do some math here, and we all do stuff like that, and we all go travel a little bit and drive a little bit, um, you know, if they live in Montreal, they, they're probably not going to come to renovation, but we're going to see them later on in heaven. You, you know, and they might say, hey, man, remember that cap you wore? <laughs> you know, that got me to thinking. You know, you, you, guys, you guys following me? Uh, uh, you know, sometimes those little things might just uh, make a big difference. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.